So, bonjour, everybody. I'm, uh, I just got coffeeed up, so we'll be good to go. That was my res aerobics for the moment. <laughs> we have had some great panels so far. <clears throat> we had uh, our first opening panel was uh, the role of multimedia production for Indigenous peoples with um, Gary Farmer and Missy Whiteman and Sir Curtis Kirby III. And then at two o'clock, we had Nadonis uh, Rose Green, uh, who is an excellent photographer, and Paul Tranny from Adobe. <clears throat> and um, right now, uh, we have the, it just keeps getting better. Uh, we're talking about respecting Indigenous storytelling traditions with multimedia production. And as I, you know, thought about the people that I know who I could ask to come and be in the panel, um, right away, I thought about Pam Belgard, uh, who has uh, helped us, you know, here at Fond du Lac Tribal and Community College to build our studio back when we first got things going. And, and she was also uh, working at Fond du Lac uh, Reservation Radio Station uh, at that time. And, um, and then uh, I also thought about Rihanna Yazzie, who's doing uh, theater and now a filmmaker down in Minneapolis, St. Paul. And, um, and Hondo Lewis has graciously offered to uh, come in and join us as well. Uh, uh, I think Al Kushlik has talked uh, to Hondo about uh, coming in and I looked at some of Hondo's stuff and I said, yes, thank you. Uh, so this is gonna be an exciting panel. Um, our general format, what we've been trying to do, but you know, like it, we will follow the flow. Um, but we'll start with just a little introduction um, from each of our panelists. And then we'll talk uh, a little specifically, more specifically about the, the topic at hand. Um, we will try to wrap up by 3.50 just to give people a break. Um, and uh, if you have um, questions, you can put your questions into the Q&A if you are in the audience as an attendee. Um, if you have questions and you're in the panelists or comments and you can put it in the chat and you can chat to either panelists or panelists and attendees. Um, I think we've been doing pretty good with that. So um, maybe Hondo, you could introduce yourself and then pass it to uh, Pam and then to Rihanna to let us, let us know who you are, how you are. Hello everybody, I'm Hondo. Glad to be a part of this panel with a very intriguing, interesting title to it. My background is about 15, 16 plus years as a small business owner, running two business entities, um, doing graphic design, film and video production for state of New Mexico, Arizona, some schools, uh, the federal government, a lot of uh, productions like that, and find some time to do some adjunct instructor teaching at some tribal colleges and universities out here in the Southwest work together with a small team of sound designers, graphic designers, editors, and camera operators. So that's how we're, I'm operating out here in the Southwest. Yeah, that's it for me. Uh, bonjour, Zashko Gijigo Kindigo, Megazi Dodem, Mekanako Wajuring and Donji. My name is Pam Belgard and I'm from the Tournament Band of Chippewa and I'm so I just want to say miigwech for asking me to join you today. I've been listening. Uh, I listened last night and I listened again so far today. And uh, I, I'm so excited. You know, uh, it's so good to share with other creatives because we're kind of out here on our own. So uh, again, miigwech for asking me to join and be a part of it and share my, uh, you know, my, my journey. So uh, yeah. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. Absolutely. Okay, Rihanna. Hi. Um, thanks for inviting me to, to this conference, Liz. Um, good to see you. <laughs> um, my name is Rihanna Yazi, and I'm um, enrolled uh, member of the Navajo Nation. You'll probably hear my cat in the background because she's on cue. Every time I have a Zoom panel, she will howl. Anyway. <laughs> I am uh, a theater director, I'm a playwright, and I'm also a filmmaker. 
and um, I, I live uh, in the Twin Cities, Santa Dakota, uh, Dakota uh, Territory, and um, originally from the Farmington, New Mexico, and Albuquerque, New Mexico uh, areas where I, I grew up. All right, I, if I run off, it's because I'm dealing with my cat. <laughs> Well, I think that's the fun part of about Zoom. So we get to hear people's cats and their children and <laughs> any other things going on. And it really, you know, for me, uh, I, I'm so grateful because uh, we have this opportunity to meet virtually like this. Um, and uh, because COVID has forced us into this, you know, uh, format. Uh, and, and um, of course, we would prefer to be face to face, but uh, at this time, you know, we're still trying to figure out how to uh, to make things happen. So virtually, um, here we are. That said, what we're going to talk about um, is about respecting Indigenous storytelling traditions, um, which uh, as Indigenous artists, as Indigenous media artists, and Indigenous uh, actors, Indigenous, you know, writers, like the, this is something that we um, bring with us into every project. Uh, and we have a certain, you know, code of, um, uh, of protocol, a certain code of, uh, you know, communication that we bring with us into every project. And depending on the project, we may or ha may not have um, control over, you know, other things in the project and, uh, and, and being, um, you know, even if we are working with an entire indigenous uh, crew, they might not all be from the same tribe. Um, you know, we might be in somebody else's territory. We, you know, like there's so many different um, perspectives that, uh, that, that we need to be aware of simultaneously when we're doing our work, right? Uh, and I don't know that other people um, have that same focus uh, like uh, indigenous uh, Americans do. Um, but we are, uh, we're, we're aware of it, um, I think, and, and we practice this readily. So that's kind of what I thought we would, you know, focus our, our talks uh, today with. Um, and, uh, and I know that each person brings a different um, body of work with them. You know, if there's something that you want us to, you know, you can, we can share a screen if you want, or we can pull something up uh, to, to share in this way, or we can just have a conversation too. Um, Earlier, Gary Farmer pulled uh, an audio piece out that he was working on um, and played that, and that was really cool. Uh, and we also saw some photography, you know, uh, and, we, and we've had great conversations. So that's the beauty of Zoom, I guess, is we have all these options uh, to do however we're gonna do. So um, I'm not sure if one of you feels compelled to begin the conversation um, or if I should lob you a question or, yeah, Ken? Okay. Um, I'll just go. I'll just dive right in. Um, I uh, first I want to say is I think that every native or indigenous project that we work on, we have to deal with. <laughs> we have to deal with cultural challenges. Um, uh, but I uh, I want to. I'm going to speak specifically to producing uh, an animation. And it was an adaptation of a traditional story. And uh, the Turtle Mountain <clears throat> tribe, the Turtle Mountain Community School District was uh, teaching out of the Mishomis book by Eddie Benton Benet. And um, they wanted to adapt into an animation a part of that, a part of the uh, origin story. So, so that, that is, that provides even more layers of stuff <laughs> that you have to have to uh, contend with that you wouldn't have to uh, under, under other conditions. For example, Eddie Benton Benet was, uh, he's a traditional spiritual leader. And um, uh, it wasn't just getting permission, you know, to use his book. <laughs> I had to find Eddie and give him tobacco and sit down and talk with him and share what we're going to do. And because no one had ever animated his story before, uh, or I mean, his works from his book, because it's a, it's a, it's a Anishinaabe 
uh, traditional story. So no one owns that story, but he put some teachings down in a book called the Michonne's book. And um, so I was working with some non-native crew people or production people. So this was really interesting because now we have so many more talented people back then we didn't have, I mean, now people are popping up everywhere. And, uh, but back then I needed to find some well-qualified folks and I was using, uh, I, I, there was, it was half and half. So they didn't understand why I had to go find Eddie in another state, <laughs> go track him down. I didn't know where this elder was. <laughs> and, you know, I'm sure he, you know, like a lot of traditional elders, like teachers, spiritual leaders, they're busy, they're traveling, they're off doing things. You, you don't know where you're going to find him. So I had to go find him, sit down with him, give him tobacco, give him cloth, whatever, whatever the protocol was. And I had to find out what that protocol was too. And, um, uh, so I found him, got his permission, and then we worked on it. And um, so that was the one challenge is I had to do that. Uh, and that took a while to do. Um, and and uh, it was interesting because the non-native production team didn't quite understand that, understand why I had to. It was so important to get that permission first. That was the first thing I had to, that was above all, above all anything else. Okay, then um, the other thing was, the big challenge was this was a traditional story and it had to be adapted into a screenplay that worked for what we're used to seeing on the screen. You know, traditional stories don't have three parts and here's the da 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 da. Traditional stories go on and on and on and on and there's no three parts, you know, three acts, nothing like that. And so we were like, I was like, oh, how can we adapt this so that people will still be, uh, and you know, well, we got to entertain them. You know, if we want the kids to to follow watch this uh, animation, they still have to be entertained. And uh, so it, the challenge was, how do we make this traditional story entertaining on an animation where these are kids who grew up watching TV, to, you know, as you know all day long that uh and these anim animations that they're used to watching are follow a formula and traditional stories don't follow a formula so that was the other big challenge was how do we adapt this to make it more entertaining you know uh, grab their attention keep their attention and they still learn so um and then i had to find an animator who would uh who could understand what I was trying to get across. And I think he and I, he's, he is so talented. He's actually, uh, 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 he's, uh, they don't call him Winnebago's anymore, Ho-Chunk. He's, he's a Ho-Chunk, uh, super talented uh, producer, director, animator. And I was really lucky to find him. Um, and uh, he, he animated a combination 2D, 3D. Um, so uh, it's good if you can find folks that can understand culture and so on. And he, he had you know, some understanding and uh, I, there was still a little bit of education because he's Ho-Chunk, I'm Anishinaabe. So there was still a little bit of education there. Um, but overall he did, a, he did a wonderful job. So those were the big challenges that I encountered in, uh, in doing uh, a real, you know, like a traditional story, not just a not just a a, a native project in Indian country, because those also, you know, I've I've worked with um, non-native crews. This is when I first started, and I may have been the only, you know, a native person on the entire crew. And they walk in and they want to go in and they want to interview elders or they want to interview a family or something. And they they're on the clock. And it's like, we got this much time to do this and this. And they just want to go in there, shoot, and they want to be done with it. And I had to explain to them, it doesn't work that way. You know, you have to develop a relationship with these people <laughs> because, you know, we can't just go in there and say, hi, sit down and shoot and expect them to open up their hearts to the camera and to the producer and be willing to share all of this wonderful, you want these wonderful juicy bits of, you know, information from them. And they're not going to do that if you don't sit down and maybe eat with them, give them, you know, whatever, uh, whatever is required 
according to their traditions, you know, let's try to follow that and, you know, develop a relationship with them. That's really important. Spend the time with them. You got to schedule up the whole day. Just spend time with them. That's the most important thing because then you're going to get some really good stuff. So anyway, uh, that's what I have to say for now, miigwech. And I'd love to hear what some of the other producers have to say. Yeah, miigwech, Pam. And it's evident in your work that relationship is always first, right? Mm, yeah, I agree. Thank you. Oh, uh, I'm not sure who wants to. It looks like Hondo unmuted. All right. Yeah, I think I can say something about digital technology. I tuned in to the last session the tail end of the conversation there. I think more than ever before, we have a democratization of filmmaking tools where, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 years ago, a lot of those tools were housed in East Coast or West Coast studios. But I think really since 2004, when digital cinema really picked up and became viable, cameras, um, editing systems, sound systems, while still, you know, not available to the, uh, to the consumer, professionals and so-called prosumers now had the opportunity to put their hands on these tools that they've never had before. And in a lot of ways, we are, because of that, at the table and that's no longer a necessarily a hurdle um, once you get your hands on these tools now the question becomes now that we're at the table what do we have to say um, and does what we have to say have to be heard and there's a lot of tensions there I think Ms. Belgard pointed out a couple of those, that of the fundamentals of storytelling, according to the Western tradition, market forces that are at play that say, this is who your target audience is, and you have to um, create and develop your content in such a way that you can be profitable so that you can keep doing these things. I think we're at an interesting point in our own tradition as indigenous native peoples in filmmaking. Mind you that other marketplaces like the Far East, the Orient have had over 100 years, 150 years of filmmaking tradition. Mm -hmm. So we're at the point now, I think, where we are in a lot of trial and error, trying to figure out what works for us, what is our storytelling structure, what is our marketplace, um, how revealing do we want to be with stories that we feel are sacred, but at the same time, we want to be genuine and authentic. But all of these kinds of tensions are things that other filmmaking traditions, multimedia traditions have gone through. And it's, it's going to be good to see in the next, I don't know, 10, 15 years, just what this uh, this digital generation comes up with as they um, were right off the bat born into a situation where these tools are readily available to them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, for now, that's what I'd like to say. I'll pass it on to Liana. Yeah, I think that's really, um really, really fascinating what you're saying, Mondo, um, just about what, um, I mean, I think the, the question comes as like, what's marketable? And um, I, I came to film um, through a theater background. Um, I, I run, a, run a native theater company in the Twin Cities, and I've been doing that for 12 years. And um, 
I, you know, when we produce theater um, at my company, New Native Theater, our focus is always Native artists and Native audiences, because I think that there's such a, a dearth of uh, programming, and specifically in theater, that um, that shows uh, the Native experience in a undigest in in a way that isn't um, centering white audiences. Um, uh, we we don't center white audiences. We don't try to um, educate non-native people because our our target demographic is native people. So what we want is for them to participate in the in watching the story or making the story in a way that um, doesn't have to become digestible or palatable to anybody else. Um, so coming from that, um, that sort of aesthetic and, and personal ethic in, into filmmaking, um, I, I took that with me. Um, I, um, I jumped into making a feature film and I never, I never made anything, um, really before that. Um, but, um, but I think that, um, sort of early on, I, I, uh, from non-native, sort of folks in the industry who gave me some uh, immediate feedback on some stuff. It was, it was really fascinating to, um, to see them ask for, can you explain <laughs> so that we can be in on the joke or can you, or oh, I don't think this conversation between uh, this, these three, uh, like there's this conversation in a karaoke bar that's kind of like, you know how it is when you're like in an inner tribal situation and you kind of like razz each other on your tribes and stuff. So there was a situation where um, there was an Ojibwe, Navajo and a Lakota uh, women sitting at a table at a karaoke bar, just like, just joking in sort of a razzing sort of way. And, um, and I was so surprised. Um, I had gotten some feedback that was like, I don't think you need that scene. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, um, no, I do need that scene. It's, it's, it's like the heart of the film. So, so it does really make you, make you, uh, look at structure, you know, sort of like the storytelling structure so that, um, which I, I, you know, I, I, I started all of this as a playwright. So m one of, one of my most favorite occupations and pastimes is like, um, dramatic structure. So <laughs> dramatic structure, either in, um, you know, in narrative form, um, you know, plays, screenplays, and, um, you know, really, really thinking about, does this scene help to uh, develop the character? Is, are, are the, is, is this story following the arc of a character from this, from the beginning all the way to the end? What is their change? And it's not just that that happens to your main character, but it happens to um, all of the characters that there's this meaningful experience. There's, there's also a, um, in, in theater, um, a, native, a native sense of an aesthetic of dramaturgy of structuring stories. And, um, you know, the thing, the thing that a screenplay structure is basically based on is sort of Aristotelian Greek structure, you know, that's sort of like a white Western way of doing things where you have to have one hero, one, you know, hero or protagonist, you know, same thing. Um, you also have to have really big conflict and oftentimes the conflict is violent. Um, and so often in sort of like native or indigenous dramaturgy or structure, a lot of times we don't have one hero or one protagonist. A lot of times it's a community plays the protagonist or so you have a lot of people who you're following at the same time and it's sort of like what's going to happen to this group of people as opposed to what's going to happen to this one individual. Um, and then another thing is uh, conflict. Um, as native people culturally kind of avoid it. <laughs> Why do we avoid it? Because it's good to avoid conflict, right? So, um, so that's, a, that's sort of another thing that you might get feedback on um, as you are 
as a native person creating stories, you might get feedback from non-native people to be like, I don't understand. Um, there's not a big conflict here. Your main character's major conflict is will they or will they not get to the bingo hall? And the whole story is based on that. So, so there's, a, there's a play called The Res Sisters and that's the major question in the play. Will these women, these seven women get to the world's largest bingo or not? And, but, but in developing the characters, um, they, they are so authentic and true to what a uh, native voice is. They talk about the things that native people um, talk about, things that we find important. At the same time, it's making political commentary, but it's not centering non-native audiences, right? And I, so I definitely, I definitely feel like, you know, there's a huge canon of native storytelling. And I think that um, it's been happening quite a bit globally, you know, I think, unfortunately, here in the US, just sort of like with the how how we were colonized, we, we have, um, we were not as far along in our sort of like, um, uh, 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 power that we own in in these mediums and storytelling, like, for instance, if you take a look at the work that's happening by First Nations folks in Canada, They've had multiple, multiple television series. They have, they, they, there are native films released um, all the time. There's a lot of stuff that I also think that like as native content makers here in the US, we, we can build on that canon um, in the way that they are centering native stories. They are centering native audiences and they, and they are saying um, hard truths that I think here in the US, uh, a lot of gatekeepers who are non-native are sort of like will discourage you from talking about like oh do you really have to talk about boarding school because it's kind of a downer <laughs> or whatever but um but i think um you know there there's definitely there's definitely a, a strong strong canon to to build onto and um and you know you know like i think uh, honda said that we um we have uh, this brand new generation where the technology is much more accessible. Like I, I'm positive I would have been a filmmaker way earlier um, if if the the technology was accessible. But I mean, as <laughs> as as a young native woman, I just I didn't have the means or or the I don't know personal <laughs> infrastructure for that. But but I, I chose another way to tell stories. So I have been working in, in theater all this time. And as, as soon as like digital storytelling came along and you know you could get really, really great quality um, um, cinematic film, um, that's that's when I was sort of like, hey, I think I can jump into this. So Thanks. Like, go ahead, Pam. I would there's something I I want to uh, add to what Hondo and Rihanna just said um and has anybody does anybody listen to tyler perry i love to listen to tyler perry's interviews i go to youtube and i i go dig him out and i want to hear what he has to say and one thing he said that just really stuck out in my mind of course there's many things he says but when he first started you know he, he uh the traditional Hollywood uh, folks wanted to change the way he wanted to tell his stories. And he was ignored by them. And he just said, you know what? Screw it. He said, I'm going to go do it myself. I'm going to do it anyway, is what he said. And uh, he did. You know, all you watch his plays, the ones that you can find. You watch his films; they're not the typical Hollywood style film. And uh, I, you know, I remember when his films first came out, and I watched them. I was like, "Oh, this is different." You know, I remember thinking, you know, I was kind of surprised. You know, I was like, "Well, this is different." You know, the way it was presented and so on. And uh, of course, it was many, many years ago. Now, you know, he's on uh, network television and films and. Um, but in the beginning, he said, screw it. I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to tell my stories, my audiences. He knew his audience and he knew they would like his stories, which they did because they, they attended his plays. And he was right. 
and now the man bought, you know, bought acres and acres of, <laughs> of uh, property, I think down in Atlanta and uh, has his own production company on a, uh, on a uh, plot of land that was, uh, what was it? it was, anyway, it's pretty ironic, the piece of property that he has, I think it was military or slave, you know, it, it's very ironic. Um, it would be like us having a production facility on Fort Snelling <laughs> in St. <Saint> Paul, <laughs> um, something along those lines. But um, anyway, so, I, anybody who needs some motivation, inspiration, I highly uh, recommend they go listen to Tyler Perry's stories because he went through what a lot of filmmakers are going, native filmmakers are going through right now. Um, and listen to him and I think you'll be inspired by what he said. But what I can say, do it anyway. Just go and do it, do it anyway. Hey, this is uh, Hondo again. I noticed the time is getting away from us pretty fast. I just want to mention a couple of things that in my own experience helped me. I think, as I mentioned in my first commentary, the foreign film tradition has had a lot more experience in trial and error in negotiating some of the things that are present before us as indigenous peoples. I think their storytelling, um, I think of Chinese uh, director Sean Jumal, as one who holds to the integrity of his culture. Um, he challenges it, he, he defines what it is within the context of his films and characters. And so the language of his culture, color, meaning, the pace, the music, even the land, the architecture, the shape of things, the way he moves his camera, all of those things have inner textuality and they mean things to that culture. I think a lot of times in filmmaking, I've certainly been done this and committed this uh, error, I think, where we find a location, but I think there's, a real strong need to connect to the land and to show the land um, beyond just, oh, this is picturesque. Mm. I think when Native people see a building, a rock, a tree, a landscape, it's so suffused with history that beyond the immediate story you're telling, there's a wealth of information and discussion that can and should be part of indigenous storytelling. I think, as I close in my comment here, if I would recommend to young filmmakers to seek out what I would refer to as uh, micro histories, um, to not be afraid to certainly show the, the beauty of your culture and your language, but also the unflattering things um, and don't be afraid to break with the continuity of the way people think history should go there's a lot of discontinuity um, and i think we need to embrace that there's sort of heaped upon native peoples this these formats of the way things should go <laughs> um, and I think it's good to every now and then break with those ideas. I think we should be a little more <clears throat> random um, and not always focused on this idea of forwarding the Aristotelian unities <laughs> and, and driving towards some ultimate end. Um, as I was saying before, I think choosing and incorporating your locations, your landscapes into your storytelling will make it even richer. Um, I think sometimes, and this uh, panel is so entitled, we often get grouped in as indigenous or native. I think it's really, really good to also capitalize on differentiation 
the uniqueness of cultures and the uniqueness of people within a culture. Um, I think those kinds of things are important to do as I go forward in my own storytelling. I am always looking at this blank sheet of paper saying, <laughs> all right, am I going to bow down to this you know, pervasive Hollywood system of this is the way you should tell your story? Or um, I, should I go you know, take a walk and sort of connect once again with that reality and do my best to stay true to that? And I find more and more that I want to do that rather than tell um, effectively, in essence, somebody else's story with my content. Uh, th that's my recommendation to the young filmmakers listening out there. That I, I, I am so, <laughs> I'm just so taken with your words, Hondo. Um, you know, uh, some something that you mentioned, um, just sort of like going into the specificity because we do get lumped in as indigenous, um, Native American, um, and there, there, I that is something I think about a lot. Is as there's this sort of like pan Indian identity that is emerging. I feel in the in in storytelling in the media, and. It, it really does, it does give me a lot of pause. It, I, I wonder like, how do we maintain our, our tribal specificity and our, 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 our cultural, uh, just like where we have come from? Because there's, so, you know, I, um, I grew up in, in Albuquerque and Farmington and I'm, I'm Navajo, that's, that's what I know. Then I moved to Los Angeles for a little while. So they had this sort of like, a little bit of a California Indian and pan Indian expat Indian experience. Then I moved out here to Minnesota and, um, and the majority of the folks here, um, they are uh, this, the homelands are Ojibwe and Dakota. And, and in each place, um, the, the history of the land is different and the history of the colonization is different. And so the way that each community expresses their, uh, their, their, their specificity as native people and tribal people is, is so different. And, and I, and I, and I do, and I do wonder, cause I think, I think this has also been something that's come up um, in my theater company. So I have um, uh, fo folks who are a bit younger than me in my theater company sort of complaining about TikTok is um, meshing together all of this sort of like tribal knowledge and, um, and that's something that I'm starting to see more and more. And it makes me wonder, are, are folks being conscious of the specificity of where we're coming from? Or is, is what we're going to move towards as Native people is this sort of like pop, I don't know if pop culture is the right idea, but it's sort of like this media created idea of what Native culture is. And um, because I know that as uh, as a Navajo person, when I walk into different tribal community spaces, I have a totally different way of being, and um, and it's it's different, and all 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 of our different communities. So so I I do I do wonder how like the accessibility and the pervasiveness of media is. Um, um, is either moving us towards that sort of pan tribal identity um, or, or is it going to draw us back to our specificity of who we are and where we've come from? So yeah, it's really things that keep me up at night to be honest. So as a producer, I got to think from the, you know, very practical and I think that's just how my mind is. It's very, you know, Kind of simple and practical. <laughs> I just got to get the job done. Um, but all producers have to do that. And I know Rihanna and Hondo could totally relate. And I'm at the point where, uh, you know, I, I have worked with companies and uh, I, I was really blessed to be able to work with various companies and have an income. But right now, you know, it's independent and 
it's like, oh my gosh, you know, I have this story in my heart that I really want to tell. And, um, you know, it, it's like, how could I ever get this done? And I think with the, with the new filmmakers or the younger filmmakers, whatever, you know, my big thing is don't give up. And um, I'm really happy that you're listening, that, you, that whoever is listening to the, our presentations and the Indigenous Fest, uh, thank you, Liz, again, for putting this together because it's like a pebble in the water and you don't know what you're really inspiring here or what's going to come from it, but I think good things are going to come from this Indigenous Fest um, for the filmmakers and for the creatives that are taking part in this. Um, seeds are being sown today in this weekend. But anyway, from my perspective, um, and especially where I'm at right now, you know, it's the pandemic and, you know, I think people have taken a big hit, whether it could be work, you know, fi finances and whatever. And my, I noticed my creative juices, sometimes they're really flowing during the pandemic more because I was more isolated. So that allowed juices to flow, you know, uh, where, <laughs> where when you're busy, busy, busy and on the go, maybe it may, may not be as much. And then there's sometimes when I'm stressed out, just darn, <laughs> just kind of stressed out from the, you know, because, due to, because of the pandemic. So um, I just want to share with folks things that I do to help keep me motivated. Um, uh, as you know, as a producer, as someone who wants to write, uh, you know, creative, whatever it is. But that's why I specifically set up this my little set here for this because I don't. It may show up backwards. I'm not sure. Does this show up? Uh, okay, but it says I. I literally have this on my wall, and this little rabbit ear because it's been rubbed. It says fear does not crown champions. Okay. Fear you cannot, <laughs> fear does not crown champions. That reminds me when I think, oh, I'm, I'm not gonna get this done or I'm not gonna be able to do this or, oh, who am I? Who am I? Who wants to listen to what I have to say? Another one is what you think matters. What you think matters, okay? But I have some more. This one says, put your ass where your heart wants to be. Put your ass where your heart wants to be, okay? Another one I have is action warrior. Action warrior, and then under that says with a purpose. And then I uh, have your heart is free, have the courage to follow it. Your heart is free, have the courage to follow it. And you know what? Some of these things I, I hear in films <laughs> and I go, oh, that's good. And I write it down and I put it on my wall. Here's another one. And this one's a big one for me because I'm a little bit older than you all. So I know I only have so many summers left to complete what I want to complete. But this one I have on my wall and it says, definition of hell, creator showing me everything I could have accomplished if only I'd tried. Everything, creator showing me everything I could have accomplished if only I tried. And that one I think about a lot because it's like, you know, Pam, don't, don't give up. Don't give up on the, the song in your heart. You know, don't go, don't pass on with these songs in your heart. You know, thing, meaning whatever it is, uh, a screenplay, a play, music, rapping, animation, whatever it is, whatever's in your heart. You know, uh, Les Brown has a great story where he said, the richest, you know who the richest people on earth are? The richest people, where you can find the richest people, go to the cemetery because that's where all those riches, the riches in their heart, the stories, everything they wanted to do, the ideas, they all went with them. That's where you can find. So it's like, don't let that happen. And I just really want to try to inspire and motivate people. Follow your heart, follow those creative juices, go for it. And I know that finances are definitely an issue. Being a producer, you know, it's like, how can we hire all these people? I know that would be another great panel. It's like, how can we find the resources? Because practicality, it's like, how can we find the resources to hire people? You know, yeah, cameras are cheaper and, and everybody can access Adobe Premiere and so on, but we still have to hire people. It still costs money. <clears throat> so, um, uh, and that can be a barrier for a lot of folks. Uh, so anyway, 
I just want to tell people, you know, don't give up. Don't give up. Follow your heart. Amigo. Yeah. Thanks for that. That was uh, that was great. Uh, I was I messaged the, uh, all these folks in the chat. I said this is great. Uh, since they're all producers, I don't need to like nudge. I don't didn't need to like direct. It was just like they're so attuned to flow that they just were like, okay, this is where where we're going. This is what I'm gonna say, and that's great, Pam. That you know the encouragement that uh, we we all need that encouragement and recognizing um you know what it is that we want to focus our attentions and and then head for that goal and yeah we don't have a panel about resources you're right that <laughs> i made a note when you wrote said okay. that if we if we host this again you know we will definitely be able to uh, include that um and but what you're sharing each one of you uh are you know it, so valuable the the nuggets of wisdom the the anecdotes the uh you know going from practical to deep i mean i am I'm, I'm really appreciative about um what each of you brought here today um in this panel um i uh you know when you put something together and you watch it unfold, you know, it's so uh, moving and I've just really been moved by this hour with all of you. So uh, thank you. We'll have, we have a few minutes for some closing comments. Maybe we'll just do the little go round uh, again for some closing comments. Um, I'm not sure what we could add because it was, this was beautiful, but you, maybe you have something else you're gonna, you know, leave us with. So uh, I'll let you, I'll let you go decide how to do that. Yeah, I wanted to be a resource right now, whoever's listening. Uh, that includes Pam and Rihanna here. Grateful to have been on this panel with them. Yeah, I've got the tools and I've got the skills. So reach out to me. Um, right on, right got on. Got cameras, got sound, got lights. I'm down here in the Southwest. I tell that to all the students I come across. And in fact, I tell them, get your story right. Because <laughs> that's going to inspire everything that I'm going to do for you. All right, off to you guys. Oh, that's 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 good to know, Honda. Because uh, there are a couple of times I was in I, I was in Farmington. And I needed I needed somebody to film some stuff for me. <laughs> so I will I will one hundred percent look you up. Um, it it's really been an honor to hear uh, all of your um, experiences and um, just you know the wisdom from your life's work, um, Pam and Hondo. I I really appreciate you Liz for asking me to be part of this this really beautiful group of people um, and yeah I want to want to just build also a little bit on what Pam and Hondo just said around resources um, I I have to tell you if you have a story in your heart that you want to tell do it don't worry about the finances because um, you're going to learn from doing it and that is how you build your craft. That's how you become the professional filmmaker or media maker that you want to be. You, you know, they say you have to do 10,000 hours uh, before you become a master at anything. So, so do it, um, you know, put, put that story on paper, um, call Hondo again and film it. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm sure he'll, I'm sure he'll do it if you give him a place to stay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, a, and a plane ticket or, or some gas money and some, some hot Cheetos. Um, and, um, but that's exactly what happened to me. I decided I'm, I'm just gonna tell this story. It was, it was stuck in my heart for a few years. I just wrote it down every day a little bit. And then when it was ready, just the forces of the universe kind of came together to support me to make it happen. And to be honest, every single little thing that I did, I put it in my savings account. And um, that's the stuff that, that, um, that funded my film. So uh, I don't know if I'm getting a, a, a stipend here today or not, but that's gonna go to my finishing my film. Um, but those little things, they just, uh, they just add up. And um, you know, before you know it, you, you, will just, you will just find the people who wanna help you tell your story and, and be brave and go for it because you can do it. And we really need your voice. You know, Native folks 
for growing up living in native community, that's the exact stories that we want and need to hear and are so important. I would like to add a little bit to um, like, because I know we have a lot of young, young filmmakers, young people uh, tuning in and, um, and many may be in their own home communities on the res. And, uh, you know, some of us are, you know, urban or whatever. But what I want to say was the way I started was I started at my tribe's radio station. I was so fascinated with technology and um, I was on the speech team in high school. I like to do plays, but uh, there was a radio. They taught a class at the high school radio station, you know, something about radio producing or something radio announcing. So I took the class and I loved it. And so I, I started working at my radio station. I worked there during the summers when I went to college. And then when I was in college, I worked at the, tri at the college radio station. And uh, I wasn't really into television production at that time because I didn't feel like it fit me because it was all, you know, uh, I just didn't feel like I fit that mold. And then uh, a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, she produced a, 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 a project called Warriors about Native American Vietnam vets. She's a non-Native woman and she was looking for Native people to be on her crew and uh or and or on her team and so she found me through uh, vision well now it's vision maker media but back then it was native american uh what was it american indian first i don't know but it was uh it, we used to be it was formerly what vision maker is now vision maker media is now so she found me and my world opened up to independent television production because at that time cameras were a hundred thousand dollars there's no way in heck you're going to be into an editing suite unless you worked for a company or, uh, and she was working for P, you know, uh, local, the local PBS uh, uh, station. Um, so, uh, but that has changed now, now like we were talking about the access. Um, but anyway, so, and then after that, I started attending film festivals. So the point is I want to tell people, go to film festivals, you know, like, like that my saying says, put your behind where your heart wants to be find, you know, go to film festivals. If you're into plays, do plays. You know, it doesn't matter if it's all native people or not. You just get in there and do it. Just dive, okay? Go go and do it. Plays, the radio, the local radio station, find like-minded, like-hearted people who also want to do, you know, uh, production. Maybe there's just two or three of you on your res that want to do it. Do it. Just do it. Um, but, uh, the other thing I did was um, through the film festivals, I found people who were producing for national networks and they always invited the young and upcoming film. Hey, if you want to get on our production, come and talk to us, you know, because they were screening their their work. Maybe it was work in progress. Hey, come on, if you want to, <clears throat> if you're interested, come and see us and we'd like to have you come and help. I was one of the first people up there. And I said, yeah, I want to help. What do I have to do? And uh, he says, okay, he took my name and number. And, um, and uh, I bugged him because he says, yeah, we're waiting for more funding to come through. We'll get in touch with you. Every like two, couple months, because this is how long it took. Every couple months, I kept calling him. Hey, have you started production yet? No, we're still waiting for funding to come through. I kept calling him and said, hey, I really want to be on your product. I really want to help. And I was just a PA. I was just a little, I didn't care. And that's the point I want to say, get on productions, be willing to do whatever you have to do. You know, if you have to go grab lunches, you have to move uh, sand, uh, you know, the, the sandbags or hold, re, you know, reflectors, it doesn't matter. And that's what I did. I just got on productions. I paid my dues. I didn't make any money or either I didn't make money at all, or I made very little money. And I didn't care because I, when I was on set, I would soak up everything. I would talk to everybody. I mean, when we were not working, I would talk to the camera people, the lighting, the gaffers, the producers, anybody who would talk to me, I would talk to them because I wanted to learn about their craft. And then I wanted to kind of see, you know, where do I fit into this? Because there's so many jobs within production itself. There's not just pointing a camera. There's not just being talent, okay? Um, so, just get in there, just get in there wherever you can. Talk to Hondo, you know, maybe Hondo's got some productions coming up. Maybe you can 
you know, be on his crew or other people. But that's the good thing about film, film festivals is you can find out who's doing what and uh, hear, you know, find out what's going on um, and, and maybe jump in, you know, get on their, get on their crews. Uh, yeah, they'll feed you, they'll put you up, maybe they'll pay you a, a little bit of, a little bit too. <laughs> <laughs> which which most people do you know they try to they try to give you a little bit so uh yeah that's what i was going to say just just go just do it do it nobody starts at the top you know nobody starts you know as the director or whatever they you have to learn you have to take the time and learn your craft and i know uh, hondo could really speak a lot to that about dping and directing and so on and and then with rihanna i mean oh my gosh i wish i had your <laughs> ability to write you know the screenplays and so on i've that's what i'm kind of working on right now so okay miigwech oh miigwech kegin yeah thank you so much this was awesome i'm so grateful to each and every one of you um, and uh, yeah, we'll do more. We're hoping we have a multimedia production degree now here on campus. I don't know if you know that, Pam. Um, so since you were last here, we grew this degree and we're gonna start having students come through and get uh, at least two years of experience working here in our studios and hopefully moving on to four-year degrees, masters, PhDs, possibly, or just get to work producing. Like boom, 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 let's do this, right? So. Um, Thank you for everything you brought here today. Uh, uh, and we will wrap up now. The next um, session starts at four and it's about audio production. It's featuring our very own JD and Chaz Wagner from KBFT. So um, do a quick stretch, come on back and we'll see you in a few. Miigwech, thank you. Miigwech.